Welcome to the Denim Think Tank discussion, Cornering the Market. My name is Tricia Carey, and I'm Director of Global Business Development for Denim at Lensing. We transform trees into tensile lysol and Modell fibers, which are used by leading denim mills and brands around the world. To learn more about tensile denim, visit our Carved in Blue blog or follow us on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter to see an amazing denim videos from our mill and brand partners, our series on Headspace, and conversations like these, you can check out our YouTube channel, Blue Lens. Marketing is often the first department impacted by budget cuts. However, it is suggested that if companies can afford to continue advertising during a crisis, they should do so in order to support the long-term health of the business. In fact, historically, it has been shown that companies that increase spending during a recession recover three times faster. Poor marketing decisions can impact a company's bottom line, with one in three customers reportedly not buying from companies that have acted inappropriately during the crisis. A people over profit sediment is starting to drive consumer spending, with over 70% saying they would stop trusting a brand indefinitely if they fail to operate this way. The rules of creativity are being rewritten during this era of experimentation, leading to new styles of marketing and ways of working that will redefine the years ahead. Marketeers must adapt and innovate or run the risk of falling behind. For designers and buyers, time and financial constraints are having an impact too. Shrinking budgets mean that frequent trade show travel is increasingly questioned and in some cases subject to cutbacks. Whilst attending physical shows may remain the cornerstone within the industry, can new B2B digital platforms enrich the customer experience allowing for editorial content, storytelling, as well as style and trend information? The denim industry is not short on ideas, in fact, product and process development has been the lifeblood of the industry for the last two decades. The question is how to communicate that vast pool of ideas. So joining me today are several marketing experts from the denim industry. We have Kara Nicholas, who is Vice President of Marketing at Cone. We have Henry Wong, who's Director of Product Development at Artistic Garment. We have Mark Ix, who is Director of Marketing at Advanced Denim. And we have Zanur Danisman, who is Marketing and Wash Manager at Orta. So thank you everyone for joining me today. Um, I, this is such an exciting topic for me because I love the marketing and storytelling. And we've had so many questions of the changes that are happening now in marketing that I thought this discussion would really provide some insight in how we see this shift happening in the denim industry. So overall, how do you define marketing today and what ways have you had to pivot your marketing campaigns? Kara, we'll start with you. Okay, um, today um, I'd say that marketing um, is connecting with our customers to meet their needs and the needs ultimately of the end consumer. Um, it's problem solving, building trust through authentic, transparent communication. Um, so it includes storytelling, education. Uh, the end consumer is more informed today. Uh, they care about how things are made, the ingredients that are used. So as Mills, um, we partner with the brands to help them tell their story to the end consumer. We assist our customers by packaging these stories in an understandable and authentic way. And I guess whether it be like, you know, communicating new sustainable technologies, innovative fibers, responsible manufacturing, ultimately we just strive to communicate information in a way that can be shared easily with the end consumer. So throughout the process, we're letting people know who we are also as a mill, um, our practices, what we stand for, uh, we're building relationships and, and we really, I really feel like we need to be authentic um, and, and to some degree, show a human side to our brand to, you know, speak to the audience as, as, as people. So pivoting a little bit now to the second part of the question, as a result of the pandemic, um, we really needed to adjust our messaging. We were all in quarantine. 
businesses went on pause. Um, so we we're all in the same situation. It was a global crisis. And we realized that, you know, people, customers may not be in the headspace to hear about the latest sustainable offering. So we started to really think about what was resonating with us um, and talk to the to the customers in that way. So we started using this more uplifting messaging, um, talking about giving back to the community. Um, and, and you know everyone really pitched in, um, every company, people personally, brands, but we found ways that denim would not have traditionally participated in, in PPE. So partnered with like our sister company Burlington um, and local shop Hudson Hill in Greensboro, North Carolina to provide the face mask kits on our web store, White Oak Shop. Uh, we, supported, we supported Ian Barry's I Clap For campaign and messaged on that. Um, you know, we had our um, Cone Community Pride Salvage that was really being distributed around that time. So we were supporting the LGBTQ community. Um, and then we also provided a view shot into how we were managing work from home um, with images of our colleagues um, in their work from home outfits or dog days of quarantine showing, you know, pets at home and, you know, it, highlighting our employees, uh, Alan Little, you know, telling, talking about him. And then we had our little dance break. I mean, so, you know, a little corny or whatever, but, you know, we had showing that we were having some fun. And so I think then that kind of led into, um, you know, the virtual trade show uh, presentation that we did for Kingpins New York, some good news, and really modeled that. We were inspired by John Krasinski's YouTube, um, you know, some good news uh, reporting, and um, you know, modeled the, our whole, our presentation after that. So the home denim edition. So really, that's I felt like we had to get creative and think of different ways to communicate, show people we were still here to support them. Um, that we're still here as a company, but and we we are in this together with them, um, and we're ready when they're when they are to talk about products. So that's, that's what we did. Yes, that was great. I like the dance party. Um, clearly, some people were practicing a bit more than others, but it definitely showed the spirit of Cone. Um, Henry, for you, how do you view marketing, and and what have you been working on at Artistic Garment? Sure, you know. The activities which uh, the business world defines as marketing, um, our activities have always focused on customer touch points. Um, as a family business, we value personalized service for our clients, and that's where we have traditionally invested in. Of course, uh, these days, flying out for the day to see clients and sharing ideas over good food and drink is not something we can easily do. But other activities like rapidly developing an entire collection for a client based on just one idea generated through a call is pretty common for us. Uh, sometimes a simple text message sharing something beautiful can turn into a product line that's a business opportunity. So these are the areas we're evolving and investing in. Um, to me, this is not really marketing, but simply being human and harnessing our innate desires to connect with each other. Um, I think it comes naturally and it, it doesn't feel like work. It's uh, pretty fun. Um, I think this strategy, if you can call it that, does have one shortcoming and that is uh, in attracting new clients and marketing and, and markets. So we've been fortunate in not needing to just buy advertisement pages in every publication and attending every single trade show, just like for the sake of being visible. Uh, we develop every new client as a potential long-term partner, and our success rate has been pretty good so far. So to reach people who do not know who we are uh, and why we do what we do, that's where we rely on traditional uh, marketing channels like social media, print, and online. And even then, it's usually because we want to tell the world about a new product or, or tech, uh, not just because we want to stay visible. So I guess we have a different view on, on marketing. Um, we're in an industry where our target market, we can name them by their name, right? We, we know exactly who they are. So it's a really um, human to human people relationship, this thing we call marketing in, in our industry for us. Yeah, no, that's great, Henry. Uh, it, it's not companies a company, it's really people to people and it's the, the people that, that drive the companies and make the difference. Um, Mark, for you at Advance? 
Well, dance, you know, I mean, the first part of the question is about marketing and de definition of marketing. And I, I don't think that's changed. I think we're still trying to have that, um, you know, connection with the customer, tell the story, and really build up who Advance is in our customers' customer's mind and have them understand what we can do for them. Uh, the changes is what's happened during COVID are pretty dramatic. Um, you know, we all travel a ton. We're all with our customers. And the, one of the number one marketing um, things we can do is, you know, as Henry said, be with your customer, be, have dinner with them, you know, show them the product. But now, you know, you're really having to be more visible and be online, um, social media, Zoom calls. So you're really having to shift how you get that message across. And I think it's very important to be in constant contact with all your customers. And we all, we all know who we are going to see and who our targets are. And um, it's important that they know that we are still moving forward that our sustainability efforts have not, you know, stopped our um, manufacturing and our developments are robust and that it's in, important that they see that on a daily basis. So, you know, it's still telling stories. It's still marketing to the customers. It's just how that's delivered. Zoom calls, social media, um, you know, print advertising again for, for the dynamic things that we're doing in the new developments. So it's, it's, a, it's a different world. I think it's pretty exciting. I think the, the change is, is difficult, but you know, the strong you know, will adapt to that change and grow from it. Definitely, there's a lot of changes and we will figure it out. Zinor, for you at Orta? Yeah. Yeah. And I think marketing today is more about putting purpose and commitment to real action. You really need to have a conscious commitment in order to meet with the needs of eco-modern generation. That's why we firstly pivoted in uh, biodesign, which we really believe it's the next generation uh, solution. We firstly pivoted in biodesign in order to match with uh, our creative ideas uh, with more bio-based and bio-inspired solutions. And on the other hand, we created our Orta Blue app in order to uh, give the fully uh, commitment to both transparency and traceability to share our data with the consumers, with the younger generations, with the young designers. We are sharing our data through our life cycle assessment methodology. And on the other hand, I think today's marketing can be assumed as the most customized marketing ever. Earliest, we were creating market-based solutions, market-based campaigns, but it is not enough. Today, it is not enough. Uh, we are almost creating customer-based, let's say personal-based uh, marketing stuff. So uh, with an integration with that new way of uh, marketing, we also pivoted in our marketing campaigns. Uh, we, uh, we divided in two. One is the, the first one is the more comprehensive one that reflects our vision that uh, such an example, uh, like our latest collection here for good and then uh, also our previous project with bio design challenge so we divided our campaigns into the first one is the comprehensive one giving the general vision and on the other hand uh, we also start to create more customized uh, solutions more customized packages for our customers for the brand separately so with that uh, customized packages, what we are doing, we are creating different videos, uh, different washes, designers, design silhouettes, the label designs, even the wordings, the key stages accordingly in order to meet their needs. So uh, during that time, we are also creating a more customized uh, narratives in order to blend our DNA and with the brand's uh, DNA, of course. Also, what we have done lately, we launch our, during our Here for Good collection, we launch our uh, collection kit, including all the swatches inside in order to explain the whole story. And then we integrated it with, with the QR codes uh, in order to integrate it more technology. And with these QR codes, it is possible to 
learn about the whole story, about the fabrics, uh, about the narratives, about the technical data. And then we combine it also with our special wash gallery. So when you read the QR code, you can even reach the washes or you can even the technical data behind it. So uh, what, what, why we did it? Because we believe that it is the uh, newest way, it is the more sustainable way in order to delivering that much of hangers, swatches, that much of uh, using fabrics, etc. So uh, in brief, I think today's marketing is more about uh, commitments, but the real commitments, real actions, and also a bit more about uh, customized solutions, I guess. Yes, no, definitely a lot of changes on the marketing side. And I think it's also, we've had to adapt how we're inspired too. In the past, we would all have seen each other in Amsterdam or at a trade show. Um, so inspiration from travel, art, vintage garments, people on the streets, which don't really, it doesn't really happen anymore. Where are you getting your inspiration now? How do you see that changing? Henry? Hmm. Uh, you know, everywhere. Um, this is probably the most difficult question here for me to answer because inspiration is everywhere and everything. If you, if I consider only the distilled forms of inspiration I consume, I would say uh, art and anything that reflects uh, consumer behavior because uh, I care about product development as well as uh, how to show off those product developments. So that includes uh, social media, um, a lot of data recently, uh, a lot of uh, great Ernst and Young and, you know, the boring stuff, McKinsey reports um, and traveling, right? Uh, when we were able to, it's great uh, because it keeps our mind open. It keeps your eyes open. And that's the best way to find uh, new ideas. And uh, which is really great because I'm in New York now, New York City. And, you know, um, through the pandemic, all the art has essentially shut down. Um, all the galleries, all the museums. And now that the uh, transmission rate is uh, significantly lower and businesses, including art galleries, have taken precautions uh, to uh, prevent any, you know, uh, any transmissions, uh, social distancing measures, they've begun to slowly open up. And uh, that's one area that we've been trying to support. Uh, go out and visit your your uh, art galleries if it feels safe, if you feel safe, uh, taking precautions. Follow them on social media. Uh, that's, I think, a, a resource that the fashion world, um, especially supply chain, should tap into a little bit more. Definitely. Yeah. For you, Mark, how do you find this, this time for inspiration? I, th I think it is challenging, but inspiration comes from a lot of different places. <clears throat> you know, uh, typically, you know, we're out with customers and we're getting inspired by the designers that we're working with. Um, we don't get as much that, of that now, but you've got to see to your end customer. You know, you've got to look at the customer and say, you know, what are they wearing? What are they liking? How can we make it better? Um, you know, if they're looking at vintage garments, do they really want a vintage garment? Do you want to go out and shop a vintage garment, buy it, send it to the mill, have it copied? No, we want to upgrade it, make it better, and have the same, you know, inspiration there. So we're seeing a lot of, you know, of us having to go out and, and do the heavy lifting and run around and, and look at all those vintage garments when we can, you know, really, really difficult. Um, you know, I think one of the things that Advance is very good at is taking the creative and mixing it with the technical. Um, and that's a lot through my career. One of the most inspiring things about being in this industry is you can take some of the smartest people in the business that are deep inside a textile mill and come out with the most amazing inventions that unlock the designer's creativity. And so that's one thing we're trying to do. We're trying to really mix, you know, the creativity of the artist, of the designer with the technology and the technician. And one of the things we've done is we're doing a um, collaboration with, uh, I think everyone knows Paolo Nuti. Um, and um, he's collaborating with Vance Denim to bring out further collections. So we're getting our inspiration from designers like Paolo and mixing it with Amy Wang 
and kind of bringing the technology and the artistry together. Yeah, I just read about that. I thought it was an excellent uh, mix. Very also cool. an east-west an east mix too, that was yeah. happening. So, yeah. great. And Zenor at Orta, how I'm, do you feel for inspiration? I definitely agree with both Mark and Henry. In, inspiration comes from everywhere. You, we cannot limit it where we can be inspired from. Of course, the travel stays, new uh, cultures, new food, chatting with new people, arts, museums, local shops, the vintage shops. They are all important. When uh, I think all of this, I cannot deny how the travels were feeding us a lot. But of course, uh, we have to make do with the virtual versions uh, for a while. We'll see. Uh, apart from that, uh, inspiration come to us comes to us in many forms. Uh, sometimes a half remembered conversation from the past can just spark an idea, or a vintage piece found in the archive can trigger a new project. Uh, since I think that I'm uh, I, I'm. I have grown up in the laundries in the last 10 years, so I always admire the vintage and the uh, craftsmanship. That's why whenever I dive into our ar archive, I'm feeling like a time traveler, because a good uh, vintage piece can reclaim the best of times to discover our basic core, the inner, our energetic core. So it, uh, the vintage pieces are always the inspiration uh, for me. Apart from that, also the uh, technological innovations in cross industries, they are always making me so excited and curious. And of course, nature. I'm feeling always vulnerable in front of the nature while discovering it, while watching the beauty, the harmony, the limitless colors inside the, uh, inside the nature. So uh, I cannot deny the inspiration that comes from nature. And uh, on the other hand, maybe, yeah, it's, it's too romantic, but I think inspiration, if we are able to see it, inspiration comes from everywhere. It can be come from the technological developments or cross industries or the vintage pieces. So I believe that uh, these, these situations cannot be limiting us. Definitely, it is everywhere. And Kara, for you, inspiration? I mean, same as everybody else, right? Um, I was going to say the same thing. You know, we're inspired by everything, um, including, you know, the art community, film, streets, nature, fashion, vintage garments, our fabric archives, uh, non-denim fabrics um, by customers, the supply chain, the denim community. We're also inspired just by our surroundings, the environment, pop culture, what's happening in the world, current events, social issues. So, I mean, just everything that's going on is um, certainly inspirational for us as well. Yeah, I mean, denim always represents the, the mood of the times and what will come out of this time will also be very interesting. I feel also that the pandemic pause has allowed us to reflect even on some of our past marketing that we've done um, and, and wonder, you know, what do you feel has been one of your better campaigns that you've developed and why? And, and do you feel that, is it all about product or is it storytelling? And can you take an okay product that's really great story and make it something more? Um, what, have, what have you thought about from the past, Mark? Oh, the past, that's a long past. Um, so I think I've been in this 30 <laughs> years. So uh, uh, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of stories, but you know, I would say probably one of the best stories, uh, one of the best campaigns is what Advanced Denim is doing right now. You know, it's, it's a mix of the technology and the art, and it's the campaign around big box diet. So, I mean, we're super excited about it. It shows the investment that Advance is making into new machinery that creates a sustainable product. Not just taking sustainable inputs and buying dyes or fibers and this, but actually physically investing in the plant. And that's kind of where the rubber meets the road, where you're really you're saying, you know, sustainability is not just a, a, a fad or a marketing ploy. We are going to sincerely invest in changing the way we dye indigo. And it's super exciting. So it's, it really is meaningful on a whole bunch of different levels. So I find that to be the most exciting, you know, um, project we're doing. And, uh, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to keep going and growing. And um, we're excited about it. Great. Zenor? 
Yeah, uh, also I don't want to go too much back. I just want to remember just last two years. When I uh, look back last two years, I think obviously our gen Generation Hemp uh, collection uh, is our best marketing campaign. Actually, it began to flourish two years ago with our common ground concept. Uh, when we launched it, we also collaborated with the Vintage Showroom and Black Horse Rain. Uh, during that co-creation, we aim to underline uh, the ecosystem that celebrates both sustainability uh, and minimalism at the same time. That is also perfectly matched with the hemp fiber itself and also with our design mentality. Uh, and after that, with the uh, Generation Hemp, uh, during that collaboration, we created really uh, great uh, silhouettes with the uh, gender free aesthetics because we believe that we are all living and rethinking the world in the same uh, planet, which is uh, in the same common ground, which is the planet Earth. So in that Earth, uh, we don't have the, we don't want to underline the genders. We underline the gender free look. So we created beautiful aesthetics. So everybody loved these aesthetics. Uh, and then uh, it was a really uh, great collaboration to underline the ecosystem that, as I said, uh, that, that uh, reflects the uh, sustainability and minimalism at the same time. And also the customers uh, who love the modern authenticity and also who praise the craftsmanship love uh, that pieces also. And apart from that, with the courtesy of hemp, uh, we, we did our work, we did our job, we learned the history about it, we learned to plant from the farmers, we collaborated with the farmers in order to learn the story, in order to have more engagement both for us and also for our customers. And we continue our collaborations, we also made another valuable collaboration with the younger designers, uh, D.B. Verdun, for both New York Fashion Week and then London Fashion Week. It was quite modernist during that collaboration. We learned that actually how we can combine sustainability together with technology and digitalization because during that collaboration, only the QR codes explain the old story, all the value behind the collaboration. Apart from that, we also support a Turkish startup who produces hemp uh, proteins for the supplements. So we try to uh, have more engagement. We try to have the ecosystem, ecosystem in order to explain the story. So I believe that all of these uh, valuable collaborations help us to uh, convince our customers and even the less enthusiastic ones uh, start to give a chance uh, for a try uh, for hemp. And uh, when I think about all this, the uh, Generation Hemp project, also the Common Ground project, uh, it's obviously, we didn't do the marketing only. Actually, we lived the journey. It was a journey for us. And I can honestly say that it was a fantastic journey. I learned a lot. I enjoyed a lot during that journey. And I'm really happy to trigger all these co-creations uh, during that journey. And now what we are doing, we are trying to build more adventures, more journeys uh, for our customers with the continuum of Generation Hemp. So I think that was the best uh, campaign and uh, it will continue to grow. That's great. Yeah, I like the idea of an adventure in the campaign. Kara, um, in your experience at Cone over the years? Yeah, what do you I'm, think? Gonna go, I'm gonna go back a little bit uh, because it set the stage for us in the future. Uh, but in 2005, um, we were, inspired by our archives and we launched uh, the Cone Deep Tone Denim concept. So the concept of, you know, really collaborations between mills and, and brands. So um, we launched Made From White Oak Cone Denim um, and we branded a whole collection of fabrics uh, from our White Oak Mill and that really set the stage for us at that time um, to start to you know, do sub brands moving forward. So we did, you know, Estine and, you know, as we continued forward, Natural Indigo and things like that. So I think really um, the made from white oak and denim really set the stage for us and was popular and, and really helped us to communicate uh, and who we were as a mill also to the end consumer and, 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 and have a broader reach. So, um, and that was inspired by the 1930s, um, you know, marketing team at Cone, um, where they did Made From Cone Deep Tone Denim. Great. And Henry? Mm, 
Our best campaign of recent times uh, may very well be our soft tech. Uh, soft tech is a technology whose benefits are built right into the name. And when clients touch the denim, they immediately say, wow, how soft and luxurious the fabric feels. Uh, it's a project that led to a recent gene by Tommy Hilfiger, who specifically mentions our company name right on the item uh, being sold at retail stores. Uh, between this and our Heddles.com uh, product collaboration, it's possible we are the first uh, Pakistani denim supplier to be co-branded directly on retail products. Um, these are huge wins for us uh, because despite how good our products and technologies are, we face challenges from a branding and positioning standpoint due to the country we are from, Pakistan. Uh, it continues to be my mission to change this perception because I believe uh, Pakistan is an important part of the future of denim. So I would say our best campaign is yet to come. Great. That's excellent. When we go to a trade show, every mill might have four stories. Say there's, you know, 100 mills. You're looking at hundreds of stories that are housed in that show. And sometimes these stories never make it past that, that hall. They never really make it to commercial reality. Were there any marketing programs that you worked on that you felt should have succeeded and perhaps didn't, Zanur? And you are right. Every time, every season, we are trying to find new innovations. We are trying to use new materials, new solutions, etc. And sometimes even between the seasons, we are working hard on that. Uh, and you can think about the research processes, development processes. Sometimes it takes six months, sometimes it takes years. But unfortunately, we are consuming them too fast. Maybe it's just the reaction of our uh, fast moving world because we have lots of options. So sometimes maybe we are not giving a chance to that options. But when I think that much effort behind that project, I think we need to give more chance to this kind of uh, materials or the projects. Because if we continue to jump from materials to other materials or from solutions to other solutions, how the innovators can focus on to grow their ideas or how they can uh, grow their lab scale ideas for the mass market. It won't be possible anymore. And uh, also when we think about startups, maybe because of that reason, the same reason, most of the startups cannot find the right ecosystem to grow because Niv is not Niv anymore. Everybody asking for the Nivus thing. And although they like the Niv, at the moment, but they're just turning back because they have lots of options. When I think about the, our earliest developments, earlier we created a kind of functional fabric that was a biobalance fabric that provides your body's daily balance. And also we had another type of functional fabrics that enhance your body's moisture and youthful in order to provide you softer skin or younger skin. Although, as I said, uh, everybody liked them at the beginning and they were also proven uh, scientifically. They were uh, approved scientifically. But just some of the brands can take this risk. Just some of the brands are open to this kind of innovations. Of course, I can understand there could be many financial reasons or other reasons behind that. But really, most of the uh, brands or the uh, producer doesn't want to take this risk. On the other hand, when I remember, we created also different kind of dye earlier, what we call it exo art. Uh, it was inspired by the tie dye technique, ancient tie dye technique. What we have done, actually, we created uh, permanent tinted patterns on the yarn before weaving. It was quite technical and the result was uh, too artisanal, but it was too specific. Sometimes this kind, this kind of uh, results uh, could be too specific or too early for the market to become a seller. Because of these kind of reasons, uh, we are consuming the innovations a lot. Actually, we would like to slow it down a little bit. And on the other hand, we have also uh, the opposite examples, uh, like the coating in denim. I think it was a fantastic example. I think nobody was expecting that much of volume or big scale when we see the first coating denim in the market. But it is a huge success. It still uh, has a huge success. Everybody used it also. Everybody is still using it. So it was a very uh, 
successful story. So maybe some of the innovations uh, are luckier than the others. Maybe they are just coming up in the right time. But what I believe, I think we need to give more chance to, especially to technical innovations, because we have uh, lots of effort behind that. And then uh, if, as I said, if we jump from materials to materials, uh, it will be not sustainable at the end. Yeah, for sure. No, we're always moving too fast and we should almost, no one uh, should ask what's new because uh, we, we need to always look, look to the past and slow this down. Kara, what are your thoughts? You know, I was thinking, um, I went back, I reflected on this, and I thought about Black Sea Denim. I thought um, our Black Sea Denim campaign uh, made with the 100% U.S. Pima cotton, it, fabrics were beautiful, people loved them, I mean, it, they sampled, but it really just wasn't the success that, you know, I think we expected it to be. Um, and I, you know, it was really nice branding around it, and um, you know, I think maybe at some point, you know, in 2006, it might have been a little bit ahead of its time and timing, but still, it just really didn't take off. And um, then it reminded me, like, hey, we should go back and look at that again, uh, talking about, you know, not creating something new, looking back to the old. But um, yeah, that was one that I really thought, this is it. This is this is fantastic, and um, really wasn't what um, anticipated. Um, yeah. No, sometimes I do think you're ahead of your time. So maybe you need to do the old trick of put it on a new header and just show mm -hmm. it again, right? I, I think we've all done that in our careers. Oh, we, I'm sure, we, won't yeah. let, <laughs> we won't let out on that. Mark, um, have you uh, taken something and put it on a new header? What are your thoughts? Uh, I've never done that, but I'll, I'll take a <laughs> note on that. Uh, but, you know, you know, to talk about what you go into a trade show or what you go into a season trying to promote and what you come out of that season as a success, there's been more throughout my career, you know, just head shaking um, ideas that did not succeed. I mean, we, you know, going way back in 1998, when, you know, we were commercializing stretch denim in the US, I had a customer of mine literally say to me, stretch for women, that'll never work. That'll never work. And I was like, why not? You know, and, and so you have millions of stories like that. You know, in 2008, stretch for men's, that'll never work. That'll never work. But it's all time. You know, you want the quick hit. You want people to get super excited because you're super excited because you've been working on this development for maybe a year, year and a half and, and trying to make the perfect product. And sometimes it doesn't sink in. And it doesn't really sink in uh, almost until they get a wear test and they get it on the bot and then they, they, you know, fiddle with the fit and make it perfect. And then it kind of clicks, you know, the same with by stretch, you know, it took years, 10 years of fits and starts to get that to be an exciting viable product. So I think patience really is, if you've got a great idea, Patience and uh, uh, Kara, go back to your Supima. There's nothing better than Supima denim. I love it, but uh, it is it's patience, and people will catch up to you. And um, you know, we find that today. You know, by stretch is is one of the biggest parts of our line right now, and you know, even the soft stretch, you know, flat modulus free tech from Advance is something that has taken time for people to understand that it's got the recovery yet it's super soft and it lays on you like a second skin. And that, people have to try it on and people have to be convinced not by words or marketing, but actually physically wearing it. So, patience. Patience, for yeah. sure. Mm -hmm. And Henry? Yeah, hindsight is uh, 2020. Um, but at the time, I couldn't understand why our campaign or our ever raw denim did not attract more attention. Um, essentially, we were pitching to denim heads a jean that did not fade. And the ever raw denim looked like indigo denim, but it stayed raw and dark forever. Um, but it also didn't stain your sofa and car seats, right? I still think this is a really cool product uh, because we know there are people who just want a crisp, dark, pair of clean jeans. Um, but maybe we just need to tell the right people about it. So, uh, Mark, I'm inspired by your words uh, patience. And, you know, 
I guess uh, patience did work for us uh, for our recent campaign for our double zero, which is uh, zero waste water indigo dyeing as well as fabric finishing. Uh, when we first came out with it, um, I was very uh, optimistic about the adoption rate. And it was around the time where there was a lot of talk about um, salt-free wastewater after indigo dyeing. And I said, well, this, our technology eliminates wastewater in the indigo dyeing, as well as the fabric finishing. I mean, that's a no-brainer, right? Uh, but I think maybe it took a long time for people to get there wrap their arms around it to really understand what it means. And we stuck with it. We kept showing it and we kept developing into it. Our leadership invested, um, you know, for dye runs, for yarns. And we said, we just need to always have a couple of products in the line to, to keep explaining to people what this thing is. And finally, um, we're seeing traction. Um, so yeah, I think patience is certainly something that's important if there's a great idea and you really believe in it. Yeah, for sure. Sometimes it's patience, sometimes it's a great product, and sometimes you also need some money. Uh, and so if you had an unlimited budget, what would you do, uh, Zinur? Yeah, it's a great question, but it's a tough one. When you say unlimited budget nowadays, I think it will be the uh, the move that will create the biggest sound will be finding an alternative name to Kanye West nowadays. <laughs> but let me think in my dreamy way, what I would do if I have the unlimited budget, of course, first of all, I would create a comprehensive marketing campaign in order to um, embarrass the whole uh, supply chain actually starting with a brand collaboration of course a, an eco activist uh, brand collaboration uh, and I will definitely invest one or maybe more than one startup in order to foster the idea together and on the other hand I will create a kind of crowdsource uh, idea in order to have uh, an, a kind of idea pool with the most useful and also the craziest idea uh, in hand. And I will definitely try to capture Gen Z minds and maybe I will create kind of uh, challenges for them. I believe that it will increase the uh, contribution and the ownership because I really believe, believe the creative minds, the uh, younger minds and also, uh, let, let's remember the uh, example, Stella McCartney example, uh, the engagement with the brand and with Biodesign Challenge and also with a startup. I always admire this kind of flexible uh, marketing campaigns, actually. It, gives, it provides also more engagement. And uh, at the end, I think the most important part will be the uh, consumer journey, the customer journey in order to uh, develop the strength, a strong uh, customer journey, most probably I will be using a gamification or thanks to uh, today's uh, technological developments in AR, VR or AI technologies. Or if I need to be a little bit more humble, uh, I will definitely use 3D printing for more uh, tangible experience, for maximum experience with real zero waste. Because I believe that uh, in my uh, dream campaign, uh, the maximum experience and uh, real zero waste uh, will be the key. And on the other hand, when you say unlimited budget, if I have really unlimited budget, uh, why not the SpaceX astronauts wearing their denims uh, during throughout their journey? The most, uh, the words most uh, strong, the most durable, and the most comfortable denim at the same time, uh, in order to step onto Mars or Moon. I'm just thinking in dreamy way, because you you are uh, you are right. If I have unlimited budget uh, and if I have my dreams, uh, there is no limit with that. So that that right. these, these ones could be my uh, dream marketing campaigns. Yes, and already we have the tagline, denim out of this world, right? So, yeah. <laughs> Mark, um, what would you do? Money's no object, what's your dream campaign? You know, you always, when you go into a campaign, what are you trying to promote and what's the end? How do you want your consumer 
to feel about you as a, as a manufacturer, as a company. And so I, I went back and thought of like, what are the most impactful campaigns in our industry? And I need to go back. And it was a, a simpler time, but, and Trisha's gonna love this, that I think the cotton campaigns of the 70s, you know, the fabric of our lives. Suddenly, you know, Cotton Inc. was the number three or four brand aware logo in the country. You know, for, for a cotton company, it was amazing. Or a BASF, you know, we don't make the products you buy, we make those products better. Something that has that kind of impact that everyone always remembers. It. Super, super difficult in our fractured world we have right now where not everyone's watching, you know, Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom on Sunday night. You know, everyone's all over the place on all sorts of different media uh, platforms. So if I had an unlimited budget, I would try to take advantage of every of where all those eyes are to get our story together. So I want Gen Z to understand that, you know, a big box dying is, is zero water or 99% water savings. And wouldn't that be exciting to buy that gene at, you know, our, our customers at our partners store. So, you know, it, it really takes a lot of focus to hit all those different levels of where those eyes are and don't be bashful to try to do it and be open to what the newness is. You know, I'm, you know, if it's TikTok, if it's uh, Instagram, if it's, you know, moving away from Facebook to some other thing, you know, pay attention to where your customer's eyes are going. But it's, I tell you with an unlimited budget, you're going to need it, you know, to really, to really make that impact. For sure. Yeah. No, you referenced some very iconic campaigns that were very well done and uh, excellent cases. Kara, you, you, uh, you have an unlimited budget. What are you going to do? This was the hardest question, Trisha. I mean, I, and by the way, I've never had a huge budget, so an unlimited budget. No, um, I mean, uh, no I really thought about it um, just going back to community. I think there's similarities in what Zanor and, and Mark are talking about, but I, I think I'm, I'm thinking of uh, going back to community and at a high level, just a celebration of denim. So um, where that would be, you know, uh, bringing the community de of denim together, but also the end consumer. And it'd be interactive and um, we could, you know, be inspirational, informative, educational. So really being the past and the future and talking about what, where denim has come from and where it is today and where it's going in a more modern way. Focusing in on sustainability and, you know, what we're doing and the investments that we're making as a company and as a, as a denim community in general to, you know, take this iconic fabric that we all love and to, you know, improve its impact on, um, on the environment. So I really thought like then we could document this, have it in like a time capsule almost. And then we look at this, you know, 50 years from now, and this is what we, we envision the future to be and like where are we versus where we were, to, you know, today. Um, but really just, I think just kind of this moment, you know, instead of well, taking this moment and kind of having it live forever in a way um, and documenting it. So really just a connection and, you know, didn't really hammer out all the details, kept it high level, but certainly was bringing community together, global cities around the world, that kind of thing. Um, but I think, you know, of course, it has to focus on what the modern take is on things and that, and that really is sustainability and where we're moving forward. Um, so, yeah. Great, thank you. And Henry? The budget unlimited fantasy um, is very, interesting uh, dream. Uh, and as I daydreamed on it, I, I realized that it, it could be kind of a nightmare. I don't like the idea of an unlimited budget. Um, I, I think, first of all, it's unsustainable. Um, and, you know, when you look at some of the projects in the tech world, you do wonder, uh, do they have an unlimited budget? Um, or in governments, uh, do they have unlimited budgets? Um, but to get to the spirit of the question, I, I would say that if I had much more to work with, um, I would want to invest in people. And I would want to invest in our clients. I would co-sponsor um, some of our clients' marketing campaigns uh, if the messaging is directed towards creating demand and consumer preference for responsibly made denim. As a supplier, we invest a lot into technologies that 
lower denim's uh, environmental impact. But in the end, it's the consumer decision to prefer those products. Let's call it the demand that drives suppliers to keep being incentivized to supply more responsibly made products. Uh, businesses need incentives to keep doing better. And I think more work needs to be done on the demand side. Uh, let's make sustainability cool. And if there's even more resources, I would say we need to affect the levers that, um, that in turn affect large systems. So for example, uh, government, when governments decided to ban plastic bags, um, plastic bags were banned. So I think that's what I would do with uh, more budgets. Great, thank you. Some wonderful insight from all of you. Um, I think this really provides us with some background of, and, and all the challenges that we do face in marketing today. And so just in closing, I'm gonna ask each of you, what do you think if you go back in time, what was the best ever denim consumer campaign? Mark? Wow, uh, you know, I took a, a kind of a deep dive into this and tried to try to figure out what was the most impactful long term. You can you can you know do the Brook Shield CK um, concept that that campaign, which was great. But I think a campaign that had the most lasting impact that both looked at you know social responsibility, sustainability, had a cool edge to it, and really showed a company. Um, fully was the Levi go forth campaign. So I really thought that was uh, fantastic and, and, and continue to evolve through each ad and you look for it through both print ads and, and um, you know, TV ads and I thought it was fantastic. And so it's again, brings sustainability, social justice and fashion all together in one. And I think they're way ahead of their time for that. Great, that was a good one. Henry? You know, there's been so many fun ones, uh, including uh, Diesel's campaign for a new CEO, uh, replace challenge for people to put on their stretchy jeans without using their hands. Um, and of course the iconic uh, Calvin Klein and Levi's uh, shrink to fit your jeans in a bathtub. But I'm going to vote for um, the original cone deep tone denim that, uh, where a denim mill can advertise directly to the end user of a product. And I think that really shapes the landscape um, of what a lot of denim suppliers are trying to do today. Sure, I like that you went back in your own history there, Henry. Uh, Zenor, what do you think? I think it's another tough question because there are lots of great campaigns. Uh, so I will pick two actually. The first one is the iconic 501 uh, campaign at uh, 1987, the year that I was born. Uh, 501 together with the uh, When a Man Loves a Woman uh, song from Percy Sledge. Uh, so it was maybe the most romantic 15 seconds together with uh, uh, 541 uh, soul, classic soul music and a love letter. Uh, a girl sees her soldier boyfriend at the bus station and uh, before he leaves, he just left a package and uh, she goes home, open the package and inside the package, she found uh, her boyfriend's X501. She just tried them on and then lies down uh, on the bed and then open the uh, love letter, start to read the love letter that she found uh, in the pocket of the jean. So during uh, that movie, the, the song uh, from Percy Select start to uh, increase. And also starting with that series, uh, the another one, the Laundret one, it was also very uh, famous. And together with that campaign, uh, I think end of the uh, 80s, uh, Levi's increased their sales around 800%, uh, so which is crazy. Thanks to classic soul music, thanks to the, uh, this soul, actually. And the other one uh, from Diesel, I think it's also uh, very iconic. When we think about the, between 1991 and 2001, when the uh, Levi's was the biggest uh, denim, uh, denim brand in Europe uh, with the around 75% market share. When uh, Diesel came uh, as a bad boy, uh, as an, um, uh, as an uh, European bad boy, uh, they 
came with the uh, campaign uh, Now It All Makes Sense. Uh, they were very, I think, uh, pro provocative against the racism and the sexuality. There were some skins that just uh, I remember. Uh, two uh, soldiers were kissing each other after the celebration of the uh, World War II, and also uh, a black man was diving in a pool that is written whites only pool. So these kind of very specific skins made them the bad boy and then they got a great reputation. And after that, we all remember Be Stupid campaign. I never forget the slogan, uh, smart may have the plans, but stupid has the stories. I think that was genius. So I, I never forget that slogan. <laughs> <laughs> Those are good ones. Those are really good. Kara? Um, yeah, I think some of the controversial ones definitely are memorable. I mean, I think that, you know, puts your, gets people to remember the campaign like the Calvin Klein. I know that one with Brooke Shields was pretty memorable. And also he had other um, pretty uh, controversial campaigns, you know, Diesel, Son of the Years. But I do have to say, I am partial to the Levi's campaigns too. So um, I definitely have to say, I think they evoke emotion. Um, they, you can really feel, uh, there's a feeling you can relate to them. And, um, you know, some of them, uh, I definitely think the go forth and the live in, um, you know, some of the campaigns there, I think really um, were the ones that, you know, resonated with me. So Mark, but we do agree on the go forth campaign. I know that was the one that I had chosen, but also live in. I think there's, sometimes it makes you just really even want to get up and dance or go out and do something like, you know, it's that kind of um, uh, evoking an emotion and, and, and resonating with you. I think those are the most important types of things, you know, having a feeling come up from it. So um, definitely, um, you know, say that's that's my choice as well great yeah so it's kind of the combination combination of the emotion the product the environment and having the right people together so all excellent examples i'm going to open now for questions if anyone has any questions for our panelists our marketing experts um would love to have uh, your input oh hi everyone how are you thanks for joining us today and uh, I know we have a couple of questions here. Hi, Zanora. Hi, Kara. Hi, Henry. We actually videotaped that, that discussion earlier. And now we have some questions from people who have uh, listened to it. And the first one, Kara, is can you tell us a little bit about the Pinto Denim uh, campaign? There's a lot of history behind that. And it'd be wonderful if you could tell us some of that story. Oh, yes, the Pinto Denim, another one from the Cone Archives. Um, okay, that's a, a great story, actually. Summer of 1969, there was a huge hurricane. Um, came through Greensboro, and really, millions of yards of denim were wet. Uh, you know, there was a flood, and so, you know, really trying to figure out what to do with the fabric. And there was a, a young marketing person in... Uh, the Cone team, uh, this is before my time, by the way, everyone, I just want to let you know that I was not here in 19, but anyway, so um, I had this idea that maybe we could run it through this solution to kind of clean up the fabric, a bleach solution to sort of give it, um, might give it a cool look. And so the Pinto denim wash was born and um, it was actually created this, you know, really cool look that was really, you know, uh, resonated with the times and had this kind of um, tie, not tie dyed effect, but you know, like kind of the street sort of look. It was very um, uh, popular. So, you know, what started out as, you know, this problem really turned into this huge marketing campaign for Cohn. Uh, and they wound up, it was so popular that brands actually asked them to replicate it. So then they had to figure out, oh my goodness, how do we replicate this look in fabric form? But um, yeah, it was an example of turning, you know, taking lemons and making it into lemonade and being creative on, on what you do. But the, the Pinto denim wash, we, we took it back, we brought it back, um, you know, a few years ago as well, um, inspired by uh, that look. Uh, but yes, Pinto, 1969. I think that's definitely when we can say that denim represents what happens during a certain time. And when you brought it back a couple of years ago, did anybody uh, adopt it? 
Yeah, people really, uh, I think they really liked it. We had, um, you know, some people that adopted it. I feel like it was a very specific look. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't the huge uh, campaign as it was maybe back in 1969, but certainly it was fun and we had some key customers that adopted it and had some fun with it. Um, and then today, you know, we would really, that's something, a look that we would, you know, look to replicate with, you know, laser technology and things like that. So there's all different ways of looking at it. I know Genealogia has done some cool things to make that, um, uh, the Pinto look uh, on, on denim. And so uh, we're, we're excited that they also replicated that in a, a more modern way. So that's a, a way of looking to the past and then taking modern technology and, and reinterpreting things. Exactly. Every time I think, you know, we can continue to combine uh, new technology or new applications that come into the market. There's another question here that if you could do a photo shoot in any location, what would it be? Henry, we'll start with you. Well, uh, I can certainly say some beautiful cities like uh, Paris or New York, um, of course, Istanbul. I'm going to pick a maybe slightly controversial one. Uh, I would say in Pakistan somewhere because there's a lot of natural beauty in Pakistan. There are places commonly described by these new tourists, um, these new new uh, social media tourists uh, who call them uh, the Swiss of South Asia. Uh, but, you know, the, the part uh, of Pakistan that we're located in, Karachi, Pakistan, is very close to uh, what was the Indus Valley civilization. This is an old Bronze Age civilization from 3300 BCE. And what's interesting is that they found actually in the archaeological sites evidence of indigo uh, cultivation as well as dyeing. So we could really trace back the roots of denim back to the whole South Asia uh, continent, subcontinent, but specifically even to where we are currently producing denim. So it goes kind of full circle and to be able to kind of go back to that, that ancient uh, history and say indigo is this dye that was always, has always been around and this is our modern version of it, our denim. I find that really beautiful. Yeah, and as you mentioned, one of the challenges of being a mill from Pakistan is that people actually understand where Pakistan can sit within the whole denim industry and to kind of, you know, it's not necessarily the most traveled country. Um, so how do you kind of open the eyes of, of the beauty of what is in Pakistan? So that could be very interesting. Uh, Zanor, for you, where would you have your next photo shoot if you could have it anywhere? Uh, I will pick Turkey, first of all, uh, because I believe we have also lots of great places. It doesn't matter if it is in the middle of the Turkey, if it is in the south of the Turkey, with the nature, with beautiful sea around, doesn't matter. But if I need to do something else, uh, my second choice would be any African city, because I believe the most colorful soul with the culture, with the food, with the energy, with music, dance, etc. I think it would be a very cherishful uh, campaign or very uh, cherishful shot. So it's hard to choose, but uh, if I can choose two, first one would be Turkey, but the second one would be any city in Africa. That's great. Kara? Oh boy, okay. Um, so, so many options here, huh? Anywhere in the world. I don't know. You know, what came to mind was um, Iceland. I don't know. I just thought some of the landscape, some of it looks like you're in another, on another planet, um, you know, sort of uh, another, you know, another place in the world, uh, not in the world, in, you know, another, you know, just sort of out of this world, I would say. So um, I don't know why that, that just sort of jumps out at me immediately. Iceland, if anyone, you know, on the own uh, management teams listening to do our next photo shoot. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a... Okay, they got the plug, Kara. They'll be working on that once, once travel restrictions are lifted. And, and uh, another question we had was about open houses. Actually, I you know had a couple of open houses planned for lensing this year. And of course, all of that has, has gone aside with everything going on with COVID. But when things do open up, and I know Kara 
you Cohen's done open houses when you had White Oak, but would you look to do op more open houses or you also had a, a denim um, education course that you used to run. Where, where do you see that fitting in the future? If we can do that safely, um, certainly, absolutely 100%. I think it really um, brings everything together, uh, whether it you know, be a, a new young designer that's you know, really passionate about a denim fabric, but maybe doesn't really understand everything that goes into uh, denim. You can watch a video or you can um, you know, uh, read a book or you know, see information about how denim's made, but it really when you get the experience firsthand, I think that's really sometimes uh, of many of us that are, you know, so passionate about what we do, that's when we were hooked, you know, that's when uh, everything kind of really fell into place. So uh, certainly um, we're always encouraging uh, customers to come visit us. And then, you know, if there's opportunity to, you know, expand that further, we always like to see what, what's possible there beyond customers. But certainly customers, we've always had them visit and, um, and education doing tours and, and, and denim 101s. Um, so, yeah, once that's safe, certainly, 100%. Yeah, I've been wondering if there's a way of doing like a VR tour, you know, could someone put on glasses, my, my son has the Oculus, so I'm always like, well, would that be one way, because how long will it take for us to be able to travel again, and how do we get people to experience, but I feel like, you know, it's also smelling, it's, it's all the other senses of how it has to come together. Um, but I've been trying to think if there's a way that we could digitally um, have more open houses and see. Um, Zenor, for you, would, are you doing any open houses? What, what happens at Orta? Cara, I definitely agree. If uh, we are able to do it in a safe and healthy way, we will definitely uh, be happy to do that. When I remember uh, two years ago, while we are celebrating our 65 years uh, anniversary, uh, we, we celebrated our anniversary with, with five different events in five different cities in the world. So it was fantastic to to become together, to uh, to live the story together, to have the uh, good moments together, share that moments together. It was very valuable experience for us. So uh, whenever we become together, uh, it's more valuable. So we'll definitely we'll be looking forward to next one. But it's the most important part. Uh, whenever we will be able to do that in a uh, safe and healthy way. Uh, I'm curious about it, honestly, but the other option would be also fantastic if we, are, we will be able to do that in a more uh, AR way or VR way. It will be also very fantastic. Definitely. Henry? Of course, uh, we're always very open and transparent to our industry. Uh, in fact, we're eager to show people our facilities. We have so many interesting uh, toys and technologies. We have robots, uh, even that uh, we usually don't capture in photos. And you know, some of our best products, our best technologies that we've introduced were direct results of people being in our facilities and creating beautiful things with our machineries and sort of riffing off of you know, what comes out of the laundry and saying, hey, it looks better if we, we added this color on top. Um, so I would say, you know, it's very hard to replace that creative process um, as hard as we try, even with the available uh, virtual reality tools, right? So I, I for one, cannot wait uh, for everyone being able to travel again. Uh, but it, it must be, of course, uh, safe and in and, and a very uh, health conscious way. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're open and we've always uh, been very open. And we, we hope for uh, the situation to calm down so we can all travel again. Yes, traveling, safety, all of that, um, you know, and the, the rest of this year is pretty uncertain. I want to thank everyone for your contribution and sharing your ideas. I really loved this conversation um, and, you know, looking back in the past of the marketing campaigns. Thank you to Mosin for putting everything together and adding in those wonderful pictures. Thanks so much. Sadia for all your help in graphics and also a big shout out to Michael Kinemont who's uh, helped immensely in putting together our webinar series. 
We have our next webinar of the Denim Think Tank coming up on August 25th, which is unzipping the trim market. Uh, I think this is an area that a lot of people, a lot of designers are trying to figure out more and also how do we address circularity, including trim. So join us in that conversation. And we're working on our plans for the fall to continue our conversations as well with the denim market. So signing off with my little uh, mini denim tensel jean from Cone White Oak. Uh, and so I want to say everyone, thank you very much. And we'll be in touch.